You're listening to the Just Japan Podcast. Everything you want to know about Japan. Hey there, everyone, and welcome to episode number 221 of the Just Japan Podcast. My name's Kevin O'Shea, and I am your host. It's been a while. He's a shibidi. Back with another episode. The last three episodes were coming out basically one episode a month, maybe the last four episodes. And I do apologize. I'll be back with a little more frequency, at least during the summer holidays. I am an international school teacher, and I'm now on summer break, so I do have some more time to focus on the Just Japan podcast. I hope you guys are doing well. I'm excited in this episode, coming back on the podcast, good friend of the Just Japan podcast, Brian Waters returns. So that's right, Brian in Fukuoka at My2Yen on Twitter. That's right, Brian was on many episodes in the original run of the Just Japan podcast. And after our long hiatus, he is back He was on an episode of the Just Asia podcast, a 30-episode or so podcast that I was was, um, putting out for a while uh, before I decided to bring the Just Japan podcast back. And we had a fantastic conversation just the other night all about his children going through the entire Japanese school system. When he first moved back to Japan, his children were five and three years old. Now his oldest is in university and has gone through the entire Japanese public school system. Now in Japanese university, his daughter is almost finished with the public school system. And he kind of reflects upon that experience. And we talk um, about a lot of different things, but mostly about that educational piece. And we have a very fascinating conversation. So sit back and enjoy my conversation with Brian Waters, a.k.a. my 2 yen all right, guys, we're back for another episode of the Just Japan podcast. And you know what? He's back. If, if, you're, if you're a fan of the Just Japan podcast, you might remember him from back in the day. He also appeared on um, an episode of the Just Asia podcast, which wasn't that far back in the day. Um, welcome back to the podcast. Brian Waters, my two yen. Thank you so much for coming on the show. Thanks for having me back. It's great to be back. I always love to be on. Awesome. And um, so a few folks have been listening for a long time. Back in the day, before the hiatus, the long hiatus, the dark hiatus, um, the long winter, um, you'll remember Brian from a lot of different episodes, and um, he's he's back again. But you know what? There are definitely people who are relatively new to the Just Japan podcast and may not know who you are. Uh, Brian, I was wondering if you could give the listeners a, a little introduction about who you are, where you're from, and uh, where you are now. Sure thing. Uh, I'm originally from the United States. I'm from North Carolina and I'm half Japanese. So I've always been interested in Japan. And then when I was in college, I got a chance to study Japanese in Nagoya, Nagoya University. And then uh, after graduating from NC State, I went on the JET program for two years. So it was an ALT right here in Fukuoka. And then uh, after two years of the JET program, I went back to the United States I got my master's degree in criminalistics or forensic science, as some people know it. And I worked for the Los Angeles County Coroner's Office in Los Angeles for uh, almost eight years. And then I got a job offer to come to Japan to work as a professor. And so now I'm a senior assistant professor at the forensic medicine department at Fukuoka University. Wow, that's very cool. And during, yes, and during that time we've talked about it over and over but yeah. I'm, I'm married a Japanese woman we have two kids who are three quarters Japanese because I'm half and and raising them and building a house and doing all that kind of stuff so in a yeah. nutshell that's that's a story we're, of me we're on one of the original episodes of the Just Japan podcast back in the day um talking about your work and then and then of course Brian was on several other episodes talking about buying a house um, about kids, uh, you know, raising a family. And that's kind of what we're going to reflect back or kind of look back on because the, that's over the course of many years. Um, you know, the Just yeah. podcast came out more than 10 years ago and um, you were on some of those kind of earlier episodes. So what I'm what I'm wondering, you know, it's again, you've you're an American. 
you know, you've, you, you grew up in the United States um, and you came to Japan, like you said, to study Japanese, you're on the JET program. And, but, you know, when we first started, talked years ago, you would kind of, you weren't that long back in Japan and uh, your kids weren't that old. So what I'm, what I'm curious to know about now is, um, you know, you're, your kids are a lot older now. So what's, I guess when we talked before about parenting, your kids were quite young. Um, what, big question, what has changed? <laughs> yeah, so, so many things have changed. Yeah. Um, when they first, when we first moved back um, to Japan from the United States, we were living in California and my kids were five and three, okay? And then we probably talked about Japanese schooling and raising kids in Japan a few times as they were getting a little bit older. Yeah, we did. And and now, if you can believe it, my son is almost 19 oh, and wow. a freshman in college. And oh, my wow. daughter okay. is, yeah, my daughter is 16 and a second year high school student. So, so things are very different. And mm -hmm. just to give a refresh for those who maybe haven't listened to that first time that we were talking. Yeah. I could not have been more glowing and complimentary towards the Japanese school system when my kids were both in elementary school. Mm -hmm. And when, when, when my son was five and my daughter were three, we moved back and they both were in, uh, well, they were both at the same Hoikuen, which is like a preschool and, Com combination kindergarten right right before the kids will start first grade yeah 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 i know that's i mean that's uh i i mean i would have left japan when my kids were just probably they each would have been a year older than that my kids were like six and four when we left right. japan and moved to china um so my son uh would have gone through three years of a at a private japanese uh kindergarten a yotian and then he was he had just finished his first term at uh, as Ichinensei at a, at the local shogako, the local public school, and and my daughter had done one year, or like part of her first year of Japanese kindergarten because usually Japanese kindergartens are three years, um, and then and then we left, and I know that, you know, when I talked to a lot of my my contemporaries who had kids who were young, I mean, they had nothing but amazing things to say about that the the kindergarten environment and and i agree like it was a fantastic experience for my kids um and then he only did like a bite-sized piece of the first year um so yeah I, I do remember you sharing um very glowing um things about you know that that early age and what it was like in elementary school but i mean uh you know they they've gotten older and you know, your son has gone through the entire system but i i often hear lots of different things you know my wife is japanese and one thing that she often talks about is like the stress and the pressure that are on kids you know one of my best friends um sarah matsumoto who's a, a an old colleague from japan and she's been on we, we host another podcast together that's about like a little geolocation game very niche um but she she's her son just got into high school and he went through the whole process of having to like write tests and have interviews for all these different private high schools and public high schools and it was just such it seemed like such a horribly stressful experience in many ways for her and for him and for her husband and the whole family so um as they got older let's talk about you know secondary life what was that like for your kids and for for your family right so uh, right up until i mean all throughout uh, elementary school everything was like fine and dandy and you know i think we've talked about this i, I love the structure and you know how the kids i mean the kids are really encouraged to be, you know, outgoing and ask questions and, and they're really, they really learn the basics very well. And it's easy to do that in Japan uh, because everything's so homogenous and standardized and all that kind of stuff. Mm. And then uh, when uh, my son got into uh, middle school or junior high, uh, that's when uh, things start to change the whole tenor of everything changes and they really buckle down and start really preparing these kids for test taking. Mm. And, um, you know, I thought maybe because, you know, I'm American and I'm from a different system and I talked to my kid, 
kids differently and tell them to, you know, talk about prioritizing different things, that that would somehow mitigate any kind of, you know, pressure that they, that they would feel about, you know, scoring well on tests or, you know, getting good grades or anything like that. Of course, we want them to do well and get good grades, but, you know, the stress that, uh, that it seems like the students are, are put in here in, in Japan uh, can be on another level. Yeah. And our experience, my experience is that it doesn't matter how much you say, look, as long as you're trying hard and doing your best, then it's okay. Uh, the pressure doesn't come from, it's not coming from us. It's not coming from the parents. I mean, sometimes I'm sure it is, but it's coming from within. It's coming from within the system. Like kids are starting to be ranked and, you know, uh, you know, the, the rankings will start and then like, who's going to be going to the good high schools and who's going to be going to the middle high schools and stuff like that. So kids, the pressure starts to come from other places, like from teachers or from the school, from the system itself, or even from when, from within themselves. Like, for example, my son who, who, uh, you know, is like, uh, he's very smart and he's very, um, hard on himself. Like even when he was going through like swimming and, and all that kind of stuff, he always puts a lot of pressure on himself to be successful. Okay. And so, you know, that if, if there's no, you know, place for that pressure to go, then it could be like really, really stressful. And even without like parents coming in and saying, you have to do well and you have to make A's and you have to do this or do that, which I'm sure happens in some families. Oh, yeah. yeah. Yeah, the pressure uh, can very much well come from within, and that's kind of what happened with him. And uh, yeah, a lot of pressure, and he was so like afraid of failing, and afraid of not not so much like not being like because because I kept telling him I was like, look, you're going to be fine. You're you're smart. You work hard. Like there's nothing to worry about, even if you don't make it into this school or whatever. Um, but that doesn't help, especially if he's got such a narrow vision for where he wants to go. Mm. So w- saying saying all that, the good thing, um, the lucky part of all of this is that he was successful. And so he did get into the schools that he wanted to get into. Okay. And, um, and so it turned out to be fine. Mm -hmm. And now he's, you know, he's enjoying his, his life and, um, and kind of enjoying the spoils of working so hard in middle school and in, uh, yeah, that's, that's that interesting. I was going to say that's that interesting part. I mean, I mean, you're just saying he's enjoying the spoils, and I mean, he he got into many of the school he wanted to. But I've also heard from many places. You know, I have friends who work in the university system in Japan who are like instructors and lecturers, and you know, it's it's kind of a bit of a, a, a different, um, you know, compared to say I can only speak for Canada because I went to university in Canada. But you know, they always say that uh, it's easy to get into a you know a good you know it's 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 pretty easy to get into university in Canada at least when I was, you know, younger, but finishing it or staying in it or doing really well once you're in university, that's a whole different story. Like we used to always joke around how like my first year, my freshman year, we had all the, call them the Christmas graduates that, you know, you'd be in a class with like a hundred people the first semester. And by January, when you come back after that holiday break, you'd only have like maybe 70 people or 65. And you're like, where the hell is everyone? Oh, they all flunked out. (laughs) Like, really? And a lot of them drank themselves out of school. Like, they flunked out because of all the partying, right? Not being able to manage it themselves and just, like, being away from home for the first time. They're like... <laughs> um, so, but uh, in Japan, it's often the hardest part is the getting into university. Once you're in there, hey. Um, yeah, maybe it's not like that at all schools, but I kind of hear... I've, I've heard the kind of anecdotes before. Um, uh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I, I think that's uh, very true. I think it's a stereotype, but I think it really comes from somewhere. Mm-hmm. And, you know, of course, every situation is different and we have to kind of say this, you know, but um, um, like I said, it's it's not like um, 
his mother and I were like on him about getting into a certain school yeah. or getting into a certain Especially university from, within, or whatever. Right? from the system. Right. From the system or, or just from his own personality, like just mm-hmm. some, like uh, here's a contrast. Like my daughter, she, she doesn't care about all of that kind of stuff. She's just like, she's enjoying her high school life and she's a second year student now. So she's, so it's, it's getting to the point where, okay, you have to start thinking about what you're going to do after high school, you know? Yeah, yeah. And, but she's just enjoying, she's on the tennis team. She enjoys time, you know, with her friends and stuff like that. So like, it's not with every student and it's not with every, you know, it really, it's dependent on a, a, a number of things. Like th- they went to different high schools. So the high school culture is different. Mm. And um, also their personalities are very different. Yeah. And so it wasn't like with our son, it was like, we never had to tell him to study because he was already studying anyway. Yeah. Right. But for my daughter, it's like getting her to study is like pulling teeth. It's like, all right, like, don't you have homework? Like, isn't there a test coming up? Come on. Can you just at least crack a book? <laughs> yeah, no, I mean, that's one of the interesting things. I mean, you know, um, that I'm, you know, we 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 were at one point in life on the path where, you know, I would have been having the same experience with both of my kids. You know, they would be going through the Japanese school system and I would be as a Canadian father fumbling through as a parent trying to support them because I don't really understand what's going on. I don't understand the school system. I didn't go through that system. I also don't have the language ability to under to to be able to support them, even if like, you know, my Japanese had reached a, a kind of decent, moderate level of conversational competency. You know, I wouldn't be able to support them with the work they were doing or the the reading they were doing. Um, but, you know, so now now here we are in an international setting. And that's one thing I've learned is that every school is very different. You know, I, this is my fourth school in my career I've been at. And one thing that I've learned is that some schools are far more rigorous than others, even in the international world. And and some schools have far higher expectations um, for students in just the curriculum. And then and then therefore the often the teachers as well. You know, there's there's I mean, I've I've worked at my my last school had far more um, rigor, I should say, than my current school. And my my current school isn't bad at all, but the last school it was just the what what I was a kindergarten teacher and I like so I was teaching you know kids who are American kindergarten age and they were expected by the end of kindergarten to be able to write paragraphs, you know it was just the, because that those that was curriculum, um, you know so it's uh, whereas in others my previous school to that in kindergarten like my daughter went to like they when they finished kindergarten they could write their name and they could write the numbers to thirty you know. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so it's just like, wow, you know, um, they're all different. So what I'm one one thing I sent you a, a few talking points before we jumped on here. And and one thing I'm curious about is as a parent looking over, you know, looking at your kids and their experience and maybe their friends' experiences and others, um, you know, what what is the difference between the kind of social experiences that kids have? And again, I know I know you you you're not a guru in this or anything. I'm just asking a dad. But you know, like I think of when I was in high school, we had dances and we had spent a lot of time hanging out with our friends. And I have this kind of stereotypical image of Japanese secondary students, especially you know, heading towards high school or heading towards university, of just having to work, 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 work. No life, no social life, no time for that stuff. Study, study. Um, am I? completely wrong with that or no i I don't think you're wrong about that i i do think there is that segment of you know the 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 school population you've got the students who they have a one-track mind they know where they want to go and they're not going to let anything stop them from doing that and i i would put my son definitely in that category and and so in terms of like social activities or out outside of school activities. Um, you know, he was on, he, he was a competitive swimmer. So he was, he was on a swim team and he, he, he did the early morning practices and, you know, I don't know, maybe like, um, a dozen times during the year, he would be, you know, at a swim meet somewhere on a weekend. Okay. And so that took, you know, that takes a considerable amount of time. And also because of that, 
you make friends just, you know, being a, a teammate and, you know, being on a team and, and yeah. all that kind of stuff. And then, you know, occasionally they, they would, uh, you know, they would go out to Yakiniku or to karaoke or whatever, you know, just a, a few of the teammates or what have you. And so they're, they're getting like, uh, they're getting some kind of social interaction that way. Mm. But there were, there were times where, you know, he was just like, no, I can't do this or I can't do that because I have to study and I'm running out of time and I need more time to study and all this kind of stuff. And he would, he would really like kind of, it would get in his head that he just didn't have enough time to study in order to be prepared for the test that he were, he was going to take. Mm. Again, a, a contrast to my daughter, and these are both like no one international schools or anything like that. They're both in uh, the, the Japanese public school system, no private schools either. So, so just to contrast, she, uh, I, I, I mean, I'm not saying she's a complete like she she doesn't study at all. She studies when when she knows she has to, but but she prioritizes, you know, her time with her friends and. Yeah. And so, and, and she gets a lot of social interaction through, um, her tennis, she plays tennis. So her tennis team and all that kind of stuff. And then friends from her class or friends from the tennis team and they go out and they do stuff, go shopping, go to the mall, just like any, you know, high school student that you would picture in, in, in any country. So there are those two kind of contrasts and, and, but I, I, I do say that the, I would say that the, the, the pressures that are put on uh, a Japanese high school student who wants to get into the best schools and, you know, be known for their academic excellence, it is, it is severe and it is, it kind of, there's the stereotype is there for a reason, I would say. Yeah. I like the term severe. Um, Cause that's, you know, one of the interesting things that you mentioned with like the rankings and I mean, the pressure, I mean, I, I've been a teacher in Korea and China as well. And these are all, these are three systems that, education systems that to to a certain degree have some similarities. And one of those being kind of that academic rigor or that academic severity for those who want to do well. And I think it would have been probably a lot more extreme in China and Korea than Japan at the moment. Um, you know, it's interesting. A lot of my Chinese colleagues, when I was living there, like teaching assistants and stuff, would say how they would literally, when you were in secondary school, when you would write tests, the, the scores, the rankings would be posted on paper outside the gates of the school for all, not just students, but family members, the general public, for everyone to see with your name and the ranking beside it. So, like, basically, the whole world knew where you stood in that school. And that could be. Um, maybe potentially a good thing for some of those who are kind of shining, but utterly humiliating and defeating for those out there who maybe weren't as strong academically. And I just, I was just, I remember being horrified hearing those tales. I'm like, oh my God, really? That's horrible. Because I would have been one of those ones who would have been like, you know, I would have walked into the gates of school, the public pointing at me going, (laughs) ah, like, you're in the bottom 10%, Kevin, because I was at some points in my academic career, I think. Um, but yeah, it's, it's, uh, and I mean, I know in, in, in Korea, the, the pressure put on kids, especially in high school to get into university is insane by a lot of parents, because it's basically the kind of the, the, the idea of the honor of the family is you you are representing the family. And if you don't get into that great school, you're kind of shaming the family. Um, you know, obviously those are kind of the more extreme cases, but, uh, I can remember like when they would have the university um, entrance tests in Korea and there was a big public high school near the English Hagwon, the English school I worked at. And I'd see the parents outside like praying and stuff on that day, like all their all day long with like like candles and stuff and praying while, while their children were inside writing the tests. Just like, oh, my God. <laughs> wow. Yeah. Um, a very next level. Um, but yeah, I, I suppose. Yeah. I mean, I'm just curious, you know, it's, it's interesting because now like even like my own kids we're in an international school setting and their life is really different than it would have been if they were growing up in Canada in the neighborhood, because, you know, you, you, where you grew up, you grew up in, was it North Carolina? Am I right? That's right. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, like you probably went to like the elementary school in your neighborhood and then you went to high school in your neighborhood. So you were kind of around those kids that you were always with and, and, you know, you could go and hang out with them after school or ride your bicycle over to their place or all get together. Whereas in here at an international school, 
or anywhere else I've worked, like my kids' classmates are spread all over a city, um, you know, because they're coming from all these different parts of a city to the school. They don't they don't have really many classmates in the neighborhood at all. Um, and when they're they're young, like you're not just going to go let them hop on a city bus and go, at least not here, you wouldn't um, hop on a city bus and go somewhere. It's not that safe. Japan luckily has that aspect. Um, so, um, you know, I think my kids didn't have the opportunity, even though they're not in Japan, to see friends and play with friends as freely as definitely as I did when I was a kid. Yeah. So it's yeah, uh, absolutely. That's that's so true. And and that starts because the the middle the junior high that's near our house, um, all the kids that go there are from this area. But then as soon as as soon as you start breaking up for high school, oh, you know, kids are yeah, kids are trying to get into you know whatever uh, the best schools that they can get into wherever they are, right? Uh, so yeah. the the be- the best public schools. And, you know, in this area, uh, you know, my son had to bike to the train station and take a train up. And then, you know, from the train station that he get, he got to, he has to walk 15 minutes and all that kind of stuff. So it's, uh, it's, it's, uh, you know, the, that's just something that you have to do. And, and there were very few of his, um, you know, really good friends from middle school that went to the same high school as he did. And so, yeah, it's something that, uh, that I, I guess people are just used to like kind of saying goodbye to their friends or, mm. um, you know, making new friends or, or what have you. Yeah. So, uh, that's something that that's very different from, from, you know, the way that we grew up. I went to the public high school in my town and, uh, you know, 2000 kids that I've seen you know, year after year since I was an elementary school student, you know? Yeah. That's like, that's so, people, people here. A lot of people I've worked with over the years here in, in, in the various countries in Asia are just always like really kind of shocked with like what I talk about, like how, you know, we didn't have choices. Like, like I, right. I, I grew up in a little, a little town of called Lewisburg. So we went to Lewisburg elementary school and then we went to junior high school at um, what was it called? George H. Lewis junior high school where everyone went and then, but our town was too small to have a high school. So we had a county high school where all the kids from all the small towns went to. And that had about 1,500 kids. But that's just where you went. Right. There was no choice. There was no other option. I want to go to that high school or this one. No, you all go to Riverview High School. Um, you know, why was it called Riverview High School? Because it was along a river. <laughs> and you could see the river, hence the Riverview. Um, you know, like, just, there it was. Um but like even like I, I'm just thinking right now what you were mentioning about you know your son with his high school. Um, my wife tells me sometimes like just one of her old like we 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 were in Kobe. We we're based in Kobe. My wife is from Osaka, but we lived in Kobe my whole time in Japan. And she had like a friend in, on our in our neighborhood in Kobe when her son got to secondary school. She wanted him to he got into a really nice private school in Kyoto, and for his entire secondary career middle school and high school he commuted every single day by himself from kobe to kyoto and that's a freaking crazy haul and he would go there in the morning yeah. and go to school all day and then come back for like six years that and it was like that's like three hours a day on the train or more four hours a day on the train like that's insane but yeah that's that's wow you know <laughs> yeah that's you know something like like uh, uh, I was talking about public schools and public schools, you know, you um, you have to kind of stay within a certain area where you live for public for public schools here in Japan. But private schools, you can go to you can go anywhere. You can go to another prefecture. I mean, I know there there are um, people who live in, up in this um, area of Fukuoka where I live, which is just south of the city, and in order to go to a really nice private high school that is down south in the prefecture i mean they have to go they have to travel like you said yeah uh, hours on tr- on a train just to get there you know and hours back you know to get home and yeah. so yeah it's people people do that stuff or they'll they'll actually like move to a dorm or something on the on the private school's campus or something like that yeah yeah well i guess that exists in in america too but um 
Yeah, yeah, it's no, just that, not something. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's that's interesting. Now, I'm 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 curious. So now your your son is in university. So I'm just I mean you know it, it, these are these are questions. Uh, the, an inquiring mind wants to know because I mean my kids um, probably definitely won't go to school. You, you won't go to university in Japan. At least maybe not in the kind of traditional sense. Maybe maybe they would in the future if there was some kind of English language program or international program that tickled their fancy, so to speak. But both of my kids, although they still study Japanese, don't they're not at a level where they could ever possibly get into a Japanese university and study in the Japanese language. Like they just don't have that. Um so you know, obviously we when we're looking at universities, you know, when I was <laughs> well I was <laughs> I was a pretty unmotivated high school student, old Kevin here. Um, I changed, I reformed as I got older, but I mean, I was like, I have no idea what I want to do. My dad's like, you're going to university. I'm like, well, I don't know what I want to do. He's like, well, you're going to university. I'm like, well, what do I do then? You'll get a bachelor of arts. <laughs> okay. And then I ended up getting like a BA and I kind of found my path once I got into school. But like my first year was that kind of just kind of a general Bachelor of Arts degree where you take on of all the survey courses and kind of figure out like maybe which direction you want to go in. Um, so how does how does the process, how did it work for your kids? Like obviously your son seems like he he was had the eye in the prize. He kind of knew what he wanted. How did that work? And, mm-hmm. and 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 your daughter, who, you know, like you said, you know, will work when when need be, but maybe her eye isn't quite as focused on the prize as your son. Um you know what would that what would the process of like hunting for a university or focusing on a university be? what was what was that like for them or for your son anyway yeah I, this is quite different from um the US and Canada I'm sure but um but uh, they start to put you down a path pretty early in your academic career here in Japan okay. so when you enter high school so your first year of high school you kind of have to decide whether you're not going whether you're going to go down a science track or down science or math track or down like a the real arts track. Okay. And so, yeah. So, um, so it's based on a lot of things, your interests and also your grades and how you did in certain subjects in middle school. And, um, it even goes to like the, the test that you would take to get into a high school. Like for example, obviously, the, the the high school that my son that my son went to was very competitive and yet there were there are people that are really good in math and science and there are people that are good in the you know in uh, Japanese and Japanese literature and, and those kind of subjects as well so they'll start uh, kind of focusing I mean of course there's a good well-rounded education in elementary and and in junior high in Japan but then Whichever you have the most interest in or the most like uh, the better grades in, you'll start kind of going down that track. So when my son entered, when my son start t- was taking the test for his high school, it was a test that was to get into the science and math track at his high school. Okay. okay. And so the test is different. The entrance exam is different. And um, also uh, while he's in, school if he's like oh yeah well i don't like science i, I think i'm going to switch that's that's not really that's not really something that you do like once you're in that track you kind of have to just grin and bear it oh okay, even okay. if you yeah you don't feel like you're you're doing that well and then uh obviously if you're on a science track in high school then you have to just ride that track on into university as well so uh and then you, you know it gets even more and more specialized so um he's studying um mechanical engineering and so but you know while he was studying for while he was uh going to cram school for um to get into university uh he was focusing on different types of tests for different majors like medical school or for you know this kind of engineering or that kind of engineering and then basically after you take all after you've gone to cram school for a year and the teachers know what your strengths and weaknesses are and you know what the scores are on all your different tests then you can say okay this is the best chance for me to get into this school well, and so that's what i'm going to focus on yeah well so yeah that is really different right yeah wow. so the t- so so for example the 
you take, I think we talked about this maybe on a previous uh, thing, but he had to take um, two uh, exams, two university entrance exams. One is the uh, entire, one is the standardized test that all uh, students that are going to go into university take. Okay. But it it is it's a different test based on what you want to study. So, for example, he had to take English, Japanese, um, chemistry, and physics and math. Okay. Okay. Those are the five subjects. So it was over two days. He had to take all these tests. It was like it's crazy. Sounds quite nightmarish. Then, yeah, it's called the center test, right? So and then. So based on the score of his center test, uh, then that kind of tells you, okay, your score is good enough to where you can, that you probably won't be able to get into, you can definitely get into this university, but this university is going to be tough. And then this university is kind of out of the question or whatever. And so like, just, just for, uh, just for uh, argument's sake, we'll, we'll say Todai, Tokyo University is the hardest school to get into in Japan. We'll just say, yeah, you're out of reach for that one. And then let's say Kyoto University, which is a very difficult uh, school to get into. You're kind of on the fence with that one. And then like Kyushu University is the best university around here in, in this area. Mm -hmm. uh, you probably can get into that one if you if you do well. And then each of those schools have their own entrance exam. So uh -huh. separate from the center test, right? Mm -hmm. So and and, and so based on the center test results, then you choose, okay, because because the, the tests kind of add together. It depends on the university's, you know, scoring system, but you can take some of the points that you got from your center test and add them to your entrance exam. So different, right? I mean, even like the Canadian yeah. American systems are so different. Like we don't have a, we didn't have a, right. standard, we didn't have the, the SATs. We didn't have any kind of standardized testing in Canada. Um, like it was oh. all. University entrance was all based on your grades. It was based on your kind of resume, the, anything you've done, volunteer work, this and that. But it was mostly primarily your grades. And sometimes you'd have to write an essay. I, I'm sure if, I mean, you know, I didn't apply for sciences. I didn't, you know, I, did, I wasn't applying to get into engineering or anything that would be math heavy or anything like that. So, um, but maybe, maybe if you, you don't have to and you'd go into those courses and they weed you out pretty quickly. Um, but even like, you know, I, I, had my bachelor of arts degree which is four years and then i had to go to get my bachelor of education which is two more years that's how you become a licensed teacher in canada um and i applied to like i don't know 10 schools for that 10 universities and like because the way it works is it doesn't matter what again the different the, the name cachet i guess isn't there so much in canada they don't you know people don't care what university you went to to get the degree as long as you have the degree because that's what I need to get my teaching license. And then once you have your license, you have your license and boom, boom, boom. Like it doesn't matter. So I, I applied to a whole bunch of schools and got into a whole bunch of them. But I just, I went to the one that was nearest my mom and dad because I hadn't seen them in years. I'm like, oh, you're near mom and dad. I go see them on weekends sometimes. <laughs> like, um, right. and, it was, and it was, and it was all my, it was my grades from my undergrad. Like literally that was what was the grades for my undergrad. And then my, uh, I had to, I think I had to write first several of them. I had to write an essay, like why I want to be a teacher or something, you know, like that. I was like, when I grew up, I want to help kids. You know, come to succeed and realize their full potential. Yeah, you, know, you know what I mean? But it was, it was very different. Right. It was, oh, it, that wasn't as rigorous. Now, mind you, you had to have like a minimum GPA even to apply. And then obviously the higher the GPA better chance you have of getting in there right um but right. again it wasn't it wasn't as maybe so stressful yeah wow. yeah i mean like it was it was similar uh for us in uh in america obviously we have the sat which is a standardized test it's the same for you know every high school student who wants to to go to university and that's broken into two major sections the math and the verbal and then you you know kind of you're under so a, a lot of universities at that time um had cutoffs you know for like mm -hmm. if you don't make this minimum level on the sat then you don't don't even bother applying that type of thing and uh and so it, it was kind of the same for uh for me in terms of like i had a lot of 
I had a few different schools in my head. Like uh, I had a safe school, backup school, you know, and then I had kind of like, this might be just barely out of reach and then like a dream school, you know. And so um, I just happened to get before, before all of, you know, before I had to go through all that rigmarole, I just happened to be lucky enough to get a scholarship to the, to the school that was going to be my, my safe school. But, um, and so that made the decision for me because my dad was like, Oh, you know, especially in the United States yeah. the price situation. Right. <laughs> right. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So, but yeah, but, but yeah, so the, the Japanese system is, uh, really, really different and, and, and crazy because, um, you've gone, you only got this one center test. That's basically the linchpin that's going to make the difference of whether you go to, you know, Tokyo university or, you know, have to settle for, uh, you know, a small university like in your town or whatever. And then, of course, private universities are kind of a backup, but, um, you know, a lot of times, uh, you don't have enough time to take all of these entrance exams because they're all different and they're all, you know, kind of spread out in that period between January and, you know, March. Mm. And so, uh, like, for example, the, the, a lot of those, um, entrance exams for like say national schools national universities are on the same day so you can't take you can't take an entrance exam for Kyushu University and for Saga University because they're on the same day so you have to choose one or the other mm. and then and then maybe you have a, a private university as your backup but you know what if you you know what if you don't get into either of them? Well, then you're just out of luck and you have to sit out a year. Yeah. You've, yeah. And then a lot of people go to what's called a Yobiko, which is kind of like a, a, a cram school for, for like, uh, for students who didn't get into the, yeah, the and then they, do it, they rinse and repeat and they do it all again the following year and hope they get a better result. Right. Exactly. And I work at a medical school and I've, um, uh, you know, Every time, you know, I have these like little conversation classes with them and sometimes I'm just asking them like, you know, so how old are you? And they'll, you know, a lot of times they're like, oh, I'm 20 or I'm 22 or whatever, you know, medical school students. And then occasionally I'll get, oh, I'm 28 or, you know, I'm, and I'm like, oh, did you, uh, did what did you do before medical school? And they're like, I was just studying to get into medical school. I was like, wait, you were just studying to get into medical school for 10 years and they're like yeah and i finally got in oh, wow okay yeah i mean the, some of these kids is it's a lot of it's usually like kids who are uh who are uh the kids the children of doctors and who who want their children to go to medical school as well okay and yeah. so it's like it doesn't matter how long maybe they didn't want to so takes. much but come hell or high water they're going to yeah Exactly. Um, yeah. I don't know if I admire their uh, tenacity or I'm fearful of uh, uh, that, those efforts. Um, you know, I'm, I'm curious, you know, I don't want to keep you too much longer here because it is uh, it's, a, it's a work night. You're a bit ahead of me in time. But I'm, I'm curious, like as a parent looking back at kind of, you know, your, your son's finished the kind of public school system now and, um, you know, your daughter is in it, but kind of coming towards the end part of it what what are some things I'm, I'm just curious about like once you know it, it seems like the you know the from what you've said and from what we said in previous podcasts that the the kind of primary side of things kindergarten the primary school was quite a nice experience and I, I hear that time and time again from so many parents and and students but what were some of the frustrations that you felt as a parent kind of looking in watching your son your kids go through that school experience was there any things that just like really piss you off or frustrated you or wish was different because you know we all as parents hate seeing our kids unhappy right um you know un unless it's us making them unhappy and then they deserve it no um but i mean <laughs> you know we do we we hate seeing that we don't want to see our kids stressed or unhappy so i am curious yeah what were some of the bigger kind of points for you that may have caused a bit of anxiety for you yeah, I mean, absolutely. I mean, we don't want to, I, I definitely didn't want to see um, my kids unhappy or not enjoying their life. I mean, you know, 
when they're when they're kids, they should be happy. They should they shouldn't be fearful or stressed out. You know that they're going to have plenty of time for that when they start working. You know, but um, but yeah. So yeah, I, I was definitely frustrated at times, but but uh, but you know, I realized that look, this is the uh, uh, this is kind of the the way it is, and. Uh, there's not really a lot that you can do and you certainly can't change things like on a dime. Mm-hmm. And so, I, I mean, I guess if things got so bad that, I mean, it, like, for example, if my son was just having a miserable time every day and maybe crying or something like that, we could have pulled him out and put him into, you know, a private school or something that's a little bit less stressful. But like I said, I mean, a lot of the pressure that he was feeling was coming you know, from his own desire to be Mm. successful and to, you know, be near the top of the rankings or what have you. And so that's, that kind of stuff is like really hard to um, mitigate, you know, from, from where I stand, because you can assure him all that you want, but if, you know, it's got, it's, it's going to be up to him to either feel that or not, you know, to see, like, so even when he was like uh, taking these, I was just going to say the only thing I can think of is like, for example, I can I can think of like in the past in life when maybe I'm at a point in in my career or when I worked at a school where I wasn't, you know, maybe, you know, when, where I, when I was working in Japan, you know, financially life was hard often. You know, we didn't I didn't make a lot of money and it was sometimes a bit of a struggle and, I, and I'd, I'd have sleepless nights and so much stress and I couldn't get over the stress of the money. And then you have people like, oh, it's OK, Kevin, don't worry about it, you know you'll get through it, buddy. Or It's okay. You know, just next month will be better. You might hear all those encouraging words, but for me, it was just like, no, and then I lay and stare at the ceiling all night long. It was eating me up inside. And even though maybe not the end of the world, it was like me doing that. Right. So maybe the same thing with your son, I was putting all this pressure on myself and the stress. And no matter how encouraging the words were coming from, from my mom or my dad or my wife or friends, it was just like, oh. <laughs> yes, exactly. Exactly. They can't see, what you, especially, um, you know, when you're, it's probably different when, when you're talking about friends or colleagues or something like that. But when you're, when you're, t- when you're looking at your own children and, you know, you've, you've gone through, you know, a form of what they've gone through in terms of, you know, going through school and, you know, having ups and downs and that kind of thing. And then you realize, you know, and, and you want to communicate to them look, it's okay. It's not the end of the world if you don't get into this school or if you do bad on this test or whatever. I mean, you know, you're, you're smart. I can see that you work hard. We can all see that. Yeah. And you're going to be fine, but they can't see that at that time, you know, for whatever reason. Especially, so you know, when you're, yeah. When you, when you throw in that just, well, I mean, there's the whole, you know, lack of experience in life because they're young and they're going through this and hormones and all of those things, which make everything crazy anyway, even on a yeah. good day. And I suppose that's the point where they, we, we, we all learn these things. Right. And often what do you say? It's, it's, you know, often um, it's better to learn by doing right. We, the, the hardest lesson or the best lessons are the ones we go through ourselves. Right. Um, yeah. Yeah. That's uh yeah my- exactly. So I mean, my only kind of uh yeah. So those those times are definitely frustrating when you're watching your kids like have a hard time and self doubt and all that kind of stuff. But you know, if I had to you know give some advice to you know some some parents who who will be going through this or maybe are are going through it now, yeah. you know, just uh, be there. You know, listen. Mm-hmm. Uh, don't try to solve everything for your kids because, uh, first of all, nine times out of 10, you know, even despite your best efforts, you're not going to solve anything for them. You're just going to make it worse or, you know, so the best advice is just kind of, you know, be there, experience this time with them and just reassure them that you're there and you support them and you're going to love them, you know, no matter what happens. And then, uh, you know, it, you know, luckily things worked out for, for, for my son, but, uh, you know, even if, uh, you know, he didn't get into these schools that he wanted to get into or whatever, uh, I'm sure it would, be, it would be fine. He would just, you know, adjust. And that's a great thing about being that age and being young and starting out in your career 
is that you have so many different paths Mm -hmm. and so many different opportunities. They can't see it. They just, they have this, you know, tunnel vision, Mm -hmm. but with those of us with experience who have pivoted and who have adjusted and have gone down so many different paths. Mm -hmm. I mean, you can relate to this too, Kevin. Yeah. Um, Yeah. Things, things work out. And even if they don't, you pivot and uh, you make the best of it. And, yeah, you know that's the that's the kind of thinking I want to kind of you know teach my my children that they can pivot and adjust and everything will be fine. Yeah, that's I mean that's one of the interesting things now too. I think more more so than any time in the past, you know, um, some of the positive takeaways we take from the whole kind of uh, age of COVID and stuff with a lot of education is so much stuff has gone online. Stuff was going online before, but now so many more things are going online, especially with like professional development and. Um, what's really interesting now is we see even people who are older, who are like me, you know, or, you know, people in their 30s and 40s and 50s, they're making pivots in their careers. And I mean, I mean, how many teachers have I met during the COVID years who are just like, I'm done with this crap. And they're just like, you know what, 20 years in, screw it. Um, and then they pivoted and they went into something else and they learned online how to become a programmer or they learned how to do this or that. And they've gone on to new careers, um, you know, and that's... Uh, it's uh pivot pivoting is is probably potentially easier now than it ever was before because we have so many new ways of acquiring new skills and once our perspective changes and we realize once that kind of we get older and have more experience that tunnel vision maybe widens more we're like oh wait a second <laughs> there's a lot more out here maybe i could do right mm. that's right also uh, one thing i also realize and and i try to communicate with my kids is like everything that you do like even if you don't succeed at it or maybe you put a lot of time in it and then, you know, you, it just doesn't work out all of that stuff, all that experience and all that knowledge and all those, you know, ups and downs, that kind of stuff, like it helps you and it adds to, you know, the kind of person that you are. And so like, for example, my, um, my son, when he was, when he was frustrated about not having enough time to study for these entrance exams and stuff, yeah. he was saying like, Oh, I should have never done swimming because I could have been, that took too much time and effort. I could have used that time to, to study more or whatever. And I'm like, son, all that, all the swimming, all that experience doing swimming. And first of all, first of all, you're extremely physically fit and that's going to just help you, you know, so much in the future. And then like all those experiences, even even the winning and the losing and, you know, having teammates and friends, that stuff is you know, that's part of you. That's part of who you are as a person. It's just so important. Right. Yeah. And when they're at that age, maybe they don't you know, they're, they're not old enough to really reflect upon that. But the stuff they learn by working as part of a team, which they will when they're with companies in the future, the tenacity of not giving up all those all those early mornings, the, the hard work, the, the the you know, the to get out of bed early in the morning and go do something maybe you don't want to do. And then so there's so there's so many incredible life lessons from playing sports like that and doing things like that. Right. That will carry on and make them more successful. And as I say, too, like when they talk about like successful business owners and CEOs, the people who are like millionaires who own these big, successful companies usually have a trail of broken, unsuccessful companies behind them um, that they fail time, and time again. And they often when you hear interviews with people who are successful business people, they, they have to say they learn from every failure and they took those lessons and move forward. Um, you know, and, uh, that's why they are where they are. Um, which is, uh, very interesting. Yeah. Master so, Yoda said, Master yeah. Yoda said the greatest teacher failure is right. Mm. Mm. Coming straight from the master's mouth. Mm. Straight from the master. <laughs> Mm. Yes, you know what, <laughs> Brian. I don't want to keep it too much longer. Um, also, I've uh, the the Just Japan Podcast Studio has um, has a shower room where I think my son probably wants to use soon. He's been cool to not come in and interrupt. Um, but uh, but yeah, so I'm wondering where where can, well I know where people can find you, but where can you can tell people where can they find you online if they want to uh, um, you know take part in your musings and uh, your your views on Japan. Yeah, you can find me on X at my two yen, or on Twitter, as those of us old school Twitter yeah. folks like to call it. I, I like it Twitter, so yeah. yeah. 
Yeah. Yeah. So, um, yeah, please tweet at me. And, um, I haven't been so active recently, but, uh, you know, every, every day I'm retweeting or, you know, perusing and stuff like that, even if I'm not, you know, sending out original tweets and stuff, it's still the place that I'm the most active, I'd say. Cool. So on Twitter or X for some of you, uh, at my two yen, and I'll put that link in the show notes. Uh, Brian, thanks so much for stopping by the podcast yet again. It's great to have you back. Always a pleasure. Thanks for having me again. All right. I want to thank Brian for coming on another episode of the Just Japan podcast. And it was fantastic talking to him. It always is. Brian, thank you so much. And of course, you can follow him on Twitter on X at my two yen. So go check that out. Um, do it. Do it now. All right, guys. Um, yeah, so I'm on a summer holiday. I'll be recording a few more episodes of this podcast in the next week or so. They'll be coming out regularly, and I'm looking forward to having you guys get some regular content. Of course, go check on YouTube. I started posting episodes of the podcast on YouTube um, and for, for you guys to enjoy. Uh, sometimes with the video version, it may actually just be the interview portion, not the intro and outro bumper little bits. But I definitely see that um, a lot of people enjoy um, consuming this content on YouTube. So there it is. Yeah. Uh, also, please come over to the Facebook page. There's a lot of action over there. I post a lot of things on the Facebook page that are nowhere else. That's uh, facebook.com slash just Japan stuff. Facebook.com slash just Japan stuff. A link will be in the show notes. So I do post a lot of photos, videos of, of kind of what's going on right now with me here, um, you know, kind of current things where I'm at in Malaysia. Um, videos from the archives, uh, photos from Japan, photos from here, photos from all over the place, a lot of stuff, but that's the only place where I put it. So go and join that amazing community. Uh, follow me on Twitter at Mad for Maple on Instagram, a few places to go on Instagram. I'll put a few links in the show notes at Jayland Kev and at Japan night scenes. Go follow those two accounts. Um, that's where I am the most active. Wow, guys. Yeah, so it's summer here in Malaysia. It's hot, but it's not as hot as it is in Japan. When we talk to family in Japan, it's hot there. And friends in Japan, it's really hot there. So it's really fascinating to see that it, it's hotter in Tokyo and Osaka and Kyoto than it is in Malaysia. Pretty wild, right? That is pretty wild. Um, yeah, uh, so unfortunately, we're not able to travel to Japan this summer or Canada this summer. We are here in Malaysia. And uh, hopefully, if all goes to plan... Uh, we will be in Osaka for the winter break, our winter holiday for Christmas and New Year's. If all goes to plan, hopefully those crazy prices, well, I'm sure they won't, but the crazy prices on accommodations will drop, I would hope. Obviously, the yen isn't the strongest, so people who run Airbnbs have jacked prices up the wazoo. It's absolutely insane how much um, Airbnbs are. And, and since my wife's uh, parents live in a very small apartment, we can't bunk with them. We need an Airbnb. And right now the prices are pretty outrageous. Um, yeah, so hopefully um, we'll be able to sort something out um, by that point. So yeah, guys, uh, that is it. Um, again, I'm going to make sure I start blogging, vlogging a little bit more on YouTube, hopefully. Um, and also I do over on that Facebook page, I had mentioned earlier, I do post content only to there. Sometimes I'll do live streams and then I just post videos on, on that platform as well. Cause that's where a lot of the kind of diehard supporters of the podcast are. Um, and speaking of supporting the podcast guys, I ask you to help the show grow by shouting, shouting the podcast out on social media, you know, wherever you are. If you love the Just Japan podcast, even if you just like us mildly, you know, just tepidly, um, please share links that I share. If, if you're a, a Twitter person, please repost the links to the podcast. If you uh, come across us on, um, on Instagram, please share. If you're on Facebook and you see, please share on your Facebook, help, help grow, post episode links and, you know, kind of Japan related Facebook pages or groups that you may be involved in and get more people listening to the podcast. Definitely appreciate that. That's how you can support us, help us grow, shout us out. And of course, um, you know, leave a great rating and review on, uh, you know, Apple podcasts or Amazon music, Spotify, wherever you listen to us. All right, guys. Well, that's it. Episode 221 of the Just Japan podcast is finito. Oh, Wadi. That's it. We're done. And I'll be back very soon. Got a lot of great guests coming up in the near future. I've got like two interviews lined up already next week. 
um, I'm going to be doing. And uh, that's so cool. So that's it, guys. Take care. Have yourself a great summer wherever you are, whether you're on holiday, whether you're not on holiday, if you're working, just wherever you are. Have a fantastic summer. And uh, I'll be talking to you in less than a month. That's for sure. We'll try coming to you again next week. All right, guys. Well, that's it for episode 221. Wherever you are in the world, I hope you are happy. I hope you are healthy. And I'll be talking to you again very soon. If you got a minute to spare, don't go anywhere. Stay right there, because Kevin is about to speak.